and, and I just pushed record. Okay. We'll see if we'll wait a little bit to see if anyone gets in. I, I thought I had made my coffee before and I didn't, so I'm just pouring it. Okay. I'm surprised we don't have anyone coming in. So, okay. Um, seeing the presence of a quorum, I am calling this uh, regular meeting of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council to order on May 11th, 2023 at 4.31 p.m. Um, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapters 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022, and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of the members of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time. This meeting is also being recorded. With that, I'm going to take um, a roll call to make sure that everyone can hear and be heard. Um, Shalini has not yet joined us, so we will catch her if she does. Pat. Present. Mandy is present. Pam. Here. Jennifer. Here. Thank you. Um, Dave Zomek will not be joining us. And Chris Brestrup, thank you for coming. Um, Chris has informed me that she has to leave at 5.30. Um, so with that, I'm going to go over the schedule just so people understand what we're doing before we move into the public hearing that is scheduled, and I pass it off to Pam to move into the public hearing. We are removing from the agenda action item 3B, 2, and 3, the bylaws and regulations on the rent residential <laughs> rental bylaw. Uh, we are awaiting um, town attorney opinion, and they are a little backed up due to all of the spring town meetings that are happening now. Um, so it will be a couple more weeks till we see that. And we will also will not um, be dealing with the minutes, the special meeting minutes of April 20th. They are not prepared yet, but we do have the April 27 meeting minutes. Um, the, the items that will be dropped if we don't have time are the permitting fee structure and the nuisance house bylaw. Um, we need to deal with planning board and ZBA appointments and all first. So um, we'll see how long our hearing goes, um, but hopefully not more than an hour and a half so we can get to at least the planning board and CVA appointment recommendation discussion, um, but we'll see. Um, with that, I'm going to pass the gavel, virtual gavel, off to Pam Rooney to open our public hearing or continue the public hearing, I guess is what it is. Continue. So it is 343, 434, excuse me. <laughs> It is 4.34 um, and we are continuing the, the zoning bylaw, Article 3, Use Regulations, Article 4, Development Methods, Article 9, Non-Conforming Lots, Uses and Structures, and Article 12, Definitions, continued for March 2, April 6, and April 27. <clears throat> to see if the town will vote to amend Article 3, Use Regulations, to change the permitting requirements for owner-occupied duplexes, affordable duplexes, non-owner-occupied duplexes, converted dwellings, townhouses to create more streamlined permitting pathways for these uses, to remove the use category subdividable dwellings, to add a use category three family detached dwelling, AKA triplex, to add a permitting pathway and standards and conditions for triplexes, to modify standards and conditions for other housing use categories, to amend permitting requirements for housing use categories in the aquifer recharge protection overlay district, to amend Article 4 development methods to add three family dwelling where appropriate, to amend Article 9 non conforming lots, uses, and structures, to add a reference to three family dwellings, to amend Article 12 definitions, to add three family detached dwelling unit triplex, and to delete subdividable dwellings. So I see Chris Brestrup here. And I would like to start by just asking if she could update us on the conversation at the planning board last Wednesday, the yeah. third. But before we do that, can we just make sure Shalini can hear us? Oh, yes. Shalini's here. Hi, yes. Shalini. Can you Sorry, hear I'm us? late. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Christine, can we get an update, please, on, on what the planning board talked about? 
Yes, um, Chris Brester, Planning Director. Um, so the Planning Board met last um, Wednesday, May 3rd, and they determined that they would focus on um, duplexes. And they had a lengthy discussion about um, duplexes, and it was based primarily on, um, or guided, I should say, by a structure, um, proposed structure that Bruce Coldham had put together, um, which I think you all have in your packets. And I suggest that that might be a good way for you to guide your own discussion about the proposal, because he breaks the discussion down into five parts, and I think they're clearly you know, uh, separated out from one another, and it makes it easier to talk about it sort of step by step rather than getting uh, confused by talk, trying to talk about it all at once. So um, the planning board had uh, various um, ideas about this proposal. Um, some people were more enthusiastic, and some people were less enthusiastic. Um, they um, shared their thoughts. Um, a person who uh, has talked about it in the past, Janet McGowan, wasn't there. There were only five members of the planning board there. Um, and they uh, didn't really come down on one side or another of the proposal. And I think they just need more time to talk about it. So what they did was they continued their public hearing to May 17th. And, um, and they'll continue to talk about it. And I think that they will use this format that Bruce has suggested for um, moving from, you know, one, one thing to another. And um, you might want to read the planning board. Um, oh, the planning board minutes aren't out yet, I guess, from for May 3rd. I'm sorry. But um, in any event, it was a good meeting. They talked about this for at least an hour, I think. Uh, isn't that right, Mandy? Uh, or you weren't there the whole time where you Pat was there. Um, but I think they talked about it for an hour and uh, they had a lot to say. Um, but as I said, they didn't um, come down on one side or another. So thank you. Thank you. And I and I have to admit that until you said the thing about Bruce Colvin's proposed structure, I hadn't actually seen it. So I just looked in my folder. I don't remember when that came in, um, but I have not studied it. So what I'm understanding by it, though, is that he's sort of gr grouping uh, categories of, um, of principal uses together to talk about as a as a cluster looks like. So the first cluster, if I can put on my reading glasses, um, owner occupied duplexes, affordable duplexes and non owner occupied duplexes was the topic for for one session. Uh, the second cluster is triplex in its entirety. The third is converted dwellings. And the fourth is townhouses. The fifth looks like the, the um, subdividable dwelling units. So he um, looks like he has structured um, the question of, I really wish I had seen this beforehand. This is unfortunate. I think okay. it came in today. Well, you know, I was busy doing some other things before this meeting. So yeah, no, I I did not have a final version of it. There were some corrections that needed made to it till last night, and um, we were all busy last night for various reasons. Um, and so it went out very late last night um, with an email. It's in the packet, but I I sent an email late last night attaching it, hoping that that would help people see it but i understand that it was very late no i haven't gotten, i haven't gotten through half my emails yet um okay so if we're if so the uh planning department planning board excuse me spent a fair amount of time talking through um the affordable and um, owner occupied duplexes and i would agree with Chris Restrup's assessment that it was, I think at one at one point the chair said, so I'm looking for direction. Is this, are we looking for tepid uh, endorsement or are we looking for basic rejection? And um, the conversation was sort of the pros and cons of, of each and every one of these items. Um, I'm at this point point though going to ask Mandy and Pat if they have any new updates 
uh, from their perspective of what they have heard and learned and um, how do we go with that? Um, so, you know, the proposal remains the same. I think the draft that is in here might have one or two fixes of Scrivener issues, um, you know, things like that, that were just the wrong word, um, but not changing any meanings. Um, we're, we're basically in hearings right now um, and trying to make it through the hearings. You know, I, I would say, um, yeah, the planning boards talked a little bit about duplexes, but their hearing is not done. Um, we can go through all of it in CRC. Um, as a CRC member, I always like hearing the planning board's report and decision, you know, sort of recommendation before I fully finish a hearing. Um, so that's more as a member, not as a sponsor. Um, so I, in some sense, I'm not sure what, what we as a committee should be doing the the sponsor at least from my point of view as a sponsor the proposal remains the same at least between the staff and the sponsors there's just that one remaining difference um that we haven't actually received any guidance from the two boards that we're hoping to get guidance from on that one per se um but um it, it's it's up for recommendation and discussion and questions sort of from my point of view as a sponsor okay. Chris has her hand up and so does Jennifer. Yep, thank you. Thank you very much. Chris Brestbrook, please. I just wanted to suggest that you might want to read through, at least start reading through um, and discussing um, this proposal from the point of view of Bruce Coldham's structure. I think my um, reservations about the zoning amendment are, um, how can I say this? They are, um, a little bit of the tail wagging the dog. I don't think we should focus on that right now. I think we should focus on the larger proposal and um, talk about each item by itself and um, come to grips with that and make a recommendation. I'm suggesting that you make a recommendation um, rather than getting lost in my particular uh, issue. So um, that's what I would recommend, go through these questions that Bruce has laid out, and I think it will give you some clarity about what is, um, how, how to talk about this. Great, thank you. Jennifer. Well, mine was just a question when um, Mandy said, I, I was gonna ask what, I wasn't sure what you were referring to when you said you were waiting for a decision on that. So, so as a CRC member, when I've done when I've chaired the meetings and when I've had to make the recommendation from the point of view as a CRC committee, I've always wanted to see what the planning board's recommendation is first before making my own, because I like taking that recommendation into consideration. Um, you know, obviously CRC and the planning board don't have to agree, but it's always nice to hear their thoughts, their recommendation, the reasons behind the recommendation as the committee I'm on gets into deliberations. Um, I, I don't know what other members think. So in that sense, I, I end up as a as a committee member, not sure what we should be doing as the planning board continues to deliberate. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like from a committee point of view, as a committee member point of view, I kind of want to just continue the hearing like a month down the road to wait until we have the planning board. Uh, no, no, information. I was also asking so. when you referred to Chris, you meant you were where you, 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 as a sponsor, you had gotten to, I mean, were you referring to the Chris's memo? I guess that's what I was asking. I wasn't sure what. I, I guess what I think last, last time, what we presented and what, what uh, the planning staff presented was that one section in Teal where uh, the two parties, the sponsors and the planning staff sort of disagreed. I'm not sure it's in teal right now anymore, but um, where the, the sort of two, the sponsors and the planning staff had different opinions as to what would be best, but beyond that had sort of reached okay. that's consensus. What I, that's what I was talking about. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. 
Are you talking about the, um, you're talking about the planning department, not the planning board, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, I thought that unless Chris, unless you have something that has that ha we haven't seen, we really had reached uh, that kind of agreement around um, duplexes. Um, and I think- I'm Sorry, you know, I'm sorry. What agreement have we reached on duplexes? In a meeting with Chris that we, the sponsors had with Chris and the planning department. Okay, got it. And one of the things that uh, Chris had said was that she felt like, and Chris, if I'm paraphrasing you incorrectly, please speak up or speak up now and then I'll continue. Go ahead. Um, I would say that I, I can support um, most of what is being proposed with the exception of the thing that I have made a recommendation on changing. And I really don't have too much more to say about that. So, um, well, I believe the change the change was to keep uh, to have it be special permit for more than two duplexes, or uh, that's correct. Or, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah. I don't feel like the thrust of your conversation should be focused on that point. I think that the thrust of your conversation should be focused on the things that are being proposed. Whether or not I agree with them or not agree with them, I think that you need to go through yeah, this no, I hear that. I, step yeah. by step and be, you know, be satisfied yeah. that you understand what's being proposed. Yep. Okay, so um, I wanted to find out if there were any general comments from any of you all on the committee before we perhaps jump into Bruce's structure of talking specifically about duplexes than about triplexes. Um, I had some general comments of my own and I didn't limit them to each of those categories. So I think I'm going to just give my general overview and then I think it might be appropriate if we want to go through at a pace um, to talk about these questions as Bruce um, has structured them, I too would actually like to hear the full-fledged discussion of the planning board because they talked about these in depth. So our conversation, I don't, I really don't know that I want to repeat everything that the planning board said. Um, let me just give, let me just give some, oh, some thought. So this is a little bit um, of detail and a little bit of generality. And what I tried to think through is what is the current status and, and what, are the, what are the components that we're dealing with uh, when we think about housing and residential zoning. So my, in the current status, I am understanding that the ZBA is finding as quote unquote compatible use uh, the mix and match of housing types. So the mix and match of Article 3 primary uses. So this allows multiple units beyond the one basic use type, adding another basic use type to it. Um, interestingly, across all of our zoning, the number of allowable units takes in no consideration to the fact that the bedroom count in a unit varies widely. So a, a four bedroom dwelling unit houses at least, at least twice as many people as a two bedroom and possibly twice as many as a one bedroom um, potentially. My general reaction to any development um, just from a construction and, and site planning and management standpoint uh, leads me to think that more than four units on any on any lot, um, particularly the RG, just because they're typically smaller lots, um, becomes a fairly complex site in a, in a hurry when you're trying to add more units. Um, there is a demand potentially for four times four bedrooms times four units, for instance, to be accommodated. And so anything over that, um, you start ending up with a fair amount of your site being parking lot screening of parking lots, um, managing um, rain runoff, 
where to put trash containers and all of that. So, so anything over a total of four units on a site, um, to me, requires a little more attention and and um, and oversight. I can talk about some of the things as as Christine has of the things that we support, and then some changes to this proposal. Um, but I think um, I want to actually hear from any of you how you feel about going through step-by-step -step duplexes and and um, Bruce Colvin's questions. And I'm going to give you an example. If you also haven't had a chance to read it like I hadn't, uh, number one was duplexes. Should owner-occupied and affordable duplexes be allowed by right in all five residential zones given proposed conditions? Should owner-occupied and affordable duplexes be allowed by site plan review in the aquifer recharge areas, given current proposed conditions? So that's kind of the, 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 the character of these questions. So it's really taking them one by one. Do you all want to talk about that in this detail today? Or do you want to, um, after public comment, do you want to continue this to another date following the planning board's conversation about the topic again. I'm looking for feedback. And I see no hand. Jennifer. No, I don't, I don't, um, I, I mean, I, it, if we have the time today, I think, you know, I, I, I we don't have probably as steeped in this as the planning board, but um, or do we want? I, I don't. I guess I'm looking for. Um, you know, I know that there are some concerns about this being in the aquifer protection overlay district. You know, altogether that that was expressed. You know, is um, I mean, you. I guess you know where I. I mean, where I stand in the bigger picture is. You know, I embrace Chris's recommendations that I think special permit, we, we should absolutely keep special permit wherever it is now and for the more than four. Uh, most of the examples of where you're doing mixed use, you're doing apartments and duplexes and um, most of those examples were in my district and I, you know, they've just benefited Im immensly from there's I, I just don't see why we wouldn't want the zba review um but i've said that before Shalini, thank you yeah i would prefer as much information from different perspectives like we've heard from planning department but also hearing from planning board but i also wanted to check in with is there like a timeline we're trying to adhere to over here other than, of course, let's keep moving forward, but is there something we have to report to council or something, something? It's a Mandy question. Yeah. Um, so kind of, I mean, not not really. I mean, it's hard to answer, right? Um, but the, the state law, um, the state law requires the council to vote within 90 days of mm -hmm. CRC closing its hearing, oh. um, which is one of the reasons we tend not to close our hearing till we know the planning board has completed its role, okay. because there's other requirements of that too um, with the planning board. But um, if, if we don't vote, if the council does not vote within 90 days of closing its own hearing, and that's why it's the CRC hearing, then it, before it votes, the council must hold another public hearing with all of the notice requirements. So we would have to re-notice the hearing, whereas if we keep continuing it, we don't have to publish it in the paper again. Um, that's the benefit of continuing the hearing. Um, you know. And so from that point of view, as long as our hearing is open, there aren't time deadlines other than what we as counselors, I would say, put on those deadlines, you know, as a sponsor, um, I, I 
you know, I'm patient. <laughs> you look at some of the other things I've sponsored and we're going on like nine months on some of these things. You know, I know things take time, um, but as a sponsor and frankly, as a counselor, I would hope that we can close a hearing and get to a vote at the council by the end of our term, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's, you know, in, in some sense, the earlier, the better, but, you know, in some sense, from from both a counselor and a sponsor point of view, the end of the term is sort of what I would say as a vote on the council is is the last sort of time I'd be aiming for. Um, early early fall would be better for you know mm -hmm. I, I feel like would be better so it's not hanging over as are we going to get done or not as thinking of transition times. But but mm -hmm. as long as the hearing is continued and not closed, there aren't state law deadlines. Thank you. That's I think what we were looking for. Right. And I would and I would agree that we don't want to pile everything into December. <laughs> that was that was a messy December. Like last time, even though we weren't on a council. <laughs> okay. Any other comments sort of relative to our our proceeding? Otherwise I think I would open it up to some public comment and get some feedback from folks. While you think while you think about it a little more. So I have three people in the audience and would would um, recognize them if they are interested in talking about zoning bylaw or actually well we're within this we're within this hearing so I think it would be relegated to this this topic. So if you want to talk weigh in on the subject of um, zoning and the proposal in front of us, you are welcome to speak up. I think they're having a coffee break. So I, oh, I do see hands. Good. Okay. I see Janet Keller. Can Janet Keller be brought in, please? I, all I wanted to say, Janet Keller, uh, 120 Pulpit Hill Road, um, all I wanted to say is it's such uh, an overwhelming amount of detail um, and coming in piecemeal um, that it's really hard for me to comment, but I appreciate the opportunity to comment and we'll uh, listen and keep notes of your conversations. Um, I appreciate the, uh, I do appreciate, want to express my appreciation of the care that uh, you're taking with the, these discussions um, and thanks. Thanks, Janet. Anyone else want to speak while, while we're open? Okay. So I'm not seeing other hands in the in the audience of three. Um, and I'm not hearing a huge appetite to go line by line and talk about duplexes specifically or triplexes specifically. Um, or converted dwellings or townhouses specifically. Um, Mandy. Oh, I, I was thinking of making a motion to continue, but Chris put her hand up, so. Let's hear Chris then. I think that at some point you should talk about these things line by mm -hmm. line, whether you have the energy for it or whatever today or not. I think it's a good way to deal with this because it is a large proposal and you won't understand it unless you go through it line by line, which, you know, I've done several times. So I feel like I have a good understanding of it now, mm -hmm. but I think I really encourage you to do that, you know, maybe before your the, the time that Mandy suggests to continue this public hearing so that you really understand what's being proposed. Okay. Thanks. Chris, Chris I, I also... Let me just follow up with Christine. Um, do you have a sense 
uh, I understand that the planning board will discuss the, the triplex on the 17th. Did they say anything beyond that of when they might tackle the other couple of items like converted dwellings and townhouses? I, I don't know what their um, plan is for scheduling. They didn't really say anything beyond that they were going to talk about duplexes the last time they met. And then they continued their public hearing with the intention to continue talking about this proposal. And they felt that um, Bruce's uh, outline for tackling it seemed like a good way to do that. So, you know, I, I think they're going to talk about triplexes next time, but I'm not absolutely yeah. sure. What they said is that they would talk about triplexes. Uh, is it triplex or triplex? I hate that word. Um, and also your, converted your dwellings choice. and subdividable uh, dwellings. Um, so I think that uh, they're doing it line by line. I um, I wanted to check with Jennifer because you were saying you liked the zoning bylaws the way it is now, and what one of the no, no, I guess I said just said I think where there's ZBA review. Okay. I want yeah. to keep that. Yeah, yeah. And then um, one of the things that I think it would be very valuable to do um, is for a Chris, the memo that you wrote, this last memo where you talked about each of the things that you could, the department could support, et cetera. Uh, that was helpful to the planning uh, board who seemed to need it to help clarify uh, the zoning. And I think it would be helpful for all of us to make sure that we're looking at that as well. Um, yeah, that's it, what I wanted to say yeah, for now. Thank you. Yeah, it's been in a packet. Okay, great. So um, I'm gonna suggest, I know Mandy, you're ready to make a motion. I'm going to suggest then that with Bruce's structure in hand, that at our next meeting that is appropriate, and you probably have a better sense of the agenda in terms of getting back to rental bylaw, et cetera. But at our next um, scheduled meeting that we in fact focus on this rather than having bylaws and rental rental agreements and you know mix and match, let's focus on this topic at which time we go through and discuss it as Bruce structured very nicely and uh, see if there's any consensus on the CRC or the way um, the way we're leaning. Um, and that means that that any and all of us should be putting in our thoughts, um, I think, into our packets ahead of time. We um, we can't put personal thoughts into a public packet. In it's time for our next meeting. Um, you just, it it would be, I think Athena would probably be better to speak on this, but it gets very close to an open meeting law violation because of the deliberate definition of deliberation, sharing your opinion on something in front of the committee, um, not in a public meeting. Okay. Athena could probably speak better to that. So if we have any write-ups that we want to share, we would do it at what time, Andy? Uh, during the hearing, um, and if you mention it, it can then go in a packet. So it would have to be something that I, that I would bring up in the meeting itself and then supply the documentation afterwards. Yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, any any uh, other ideas about the, putting this putting this focused topic kind of the line by line, our version of line by line for our next primary meeting? Oh. Okay. Mandy Joe. Right. Oh, Jennifer, you want to say something before? No, no, just I agree. And I really appreciate um Chris. I think you're right. We should understand this as well as the planning board line by line. So and this way, since we have it, we can all read it, yeah. you know, bone up before the next meeting. Right. Okay. Mandy, you ready for a motion? So um I changed the date on mine given what everyone said. So I'm gonna make a motion. Um to continue the public hearing to May 25 at 4.35 p.m. Second. All those in favor, Pat. Aye. 
and you were, I mean, I didn't mean to say all those in favor. Yeah, I can second it. I thought somebody had because you said what you said. Anyway, no, I didn't. Uh, Jennifer. Yes. Colony. Yes. Mandy. Aye. And Pam is an aye also. So you're accepting my aye from before? <laughs> Okay, so that that we focus on it next next round. So, Chris, you can run away. So, no, I, I think it's to me now, right? Because yep, I so, yep. The, so the I, I think back. Chris might be done for the day, but I think Chris might be raising her hand to be able to introduce someone. Is that correct? Oh well, um, <laughs> I I did want to say I won't be here on the twenty fifth. I'm going to be on vacation. But um, do I want to introduce um, Rob Wachilla? Of course I do. Rob Wachilla is now the staff person for the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, I think he was um, thinking that he wouldn't be taking a major role in today's meeting, and so he was listening in. But if you need him to be um, front and center, he can do that. Um, and I think he was going to listen in about the Zoning Board um, appointments. Is that correct? Yep. Mm -hmm. So if Rob can we Wachilla, see his face? If, if Rob Wachilla, if you're there, can you show your face? Hey, Rob. Nice to meet you. Hi. Nice to meet you all. I apologize. My dog is barking out the window, so I have to try to call him <laughs> down. <laughs> Hi, Rob. Welcome. Yeah, welcome. welcome. Yeah. And yep. Rob has a ZBA meeting that starts at yeah. six, so he's yeah, right. also on the same yeah, time. What did we yeah, say? You you're not a black yourself too soon. Yeah. You can we, I, uh, you can you can un unvideo yourself if you'd like, Rob. But I thought it would be nice for us to all say hi to you and and have you introduced as one of our newest planning uh, the newest planning staff member, I guess, um, at this point. So I'm sure we'll be welcome. seeing more of you over the course of time. So welcome, <laughs> Rob. Thank you. I appreciate it. I will turn off my video. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And then I, I while while we're on things before we actually go to the planning board and ZBA appointment recommendations, um, I just want to let Rob Moore know um, we are not going to deal with the bylaw and regulations for rental per permitting today, but we will probably, given the time, have time to get to the permitting fee structure, at least a little bit of it. So, um, but we'll we have to do the recommendation process first. <laughs> so, so it'll be a little bit, Rob. But um, okay. So we are going to move on to action item 3A, which is the planning board and ZBA appointment recommendations. Um, the first things we need to discuss are sufficiency of the applicant pool for each of the boards. Um, I apologize, I did not um, create the document I normally create. Um, so, but I'm having problems with my own things here. So, um, but I, I will go over some of the information um, out loud and we can make those decisions. So um, we'll start with the planning board. Currently there are um, five applicants for three positions. Um, those applicants age in range from the 40 to 49 age range all the way up to the um, 70 to 79 age range. Um, of those five, um, two have identified as either female or woman, and three have identified as male. Um, and racial ethnic background, there is a variety of identifications of white, um, white Hispanic, biracial, black, white, black, African, American. Um, amongst them, language is spoken. Um, one is English and German, and all the others identified English. And the districts, there is, uh, I said there were five applicants, right? Um, Pam just consolidated mine. Hold on. on I must have done that now. Um, and there is right now... I thought it was one from every district, but we have applicants from districts one, two, four, and five. Um, 
So that is the status of the planning board applicant pool. Um, and we can decide to make a decision on whether the pool is sufficient or not today. Um, if we decide that the pool is sufficient, we will, the next job to do is to, behind the scenes is to schedule an interview date, um, contact everyone who's in the applicant pool and aim for interviews, um, see if we can find a date that everyone um, can make for interviews. Um, given the public hearing on May 25th, I think we'd be aiming for June 8th um, if we were trying to do it during a CRC time, but I would obviously offer up a whole lot of times because that tends to be what we need to do in order to find a time everyone can make. Um, we would also, if we declared the pool sufficient today, we would try to at least adopt the um, selection criteria so that we can send that out to solicit statements of interest um, before the deadline for the interviews. Um, we do not have to adopt the interview questions today. Um, they just need adopted the meeting about seven, they, a minimum of seven days before the interview meeting. Um, so, so we would be potentially doing that today. So that is what would next steps be. If we don't declare the pool sufficient, I think we will still aim to at least adopt the selection criteria to get that out of the way. Um, we might skip the interview questions though, because then we probably have a little more time. But um, so that's thoughts. So thoughts on sufficiency of the applicant pool. Jennifer. I actually had another a question. Um... I wasn't coming um, on the applicant pool, but somebody um, that I had, somebody asked me when the due date was. And since we didn't really have one, they asked if they could get it in when they got back from vacation early this week. So could they, could an application still, if we declare it sufficient, they could still, we would accept more applications. Okay, thank you. For those not seeing, that nod was a yes, we do until the pool is technically closed the day the meeting agenda for the interviews is posted, which is a week before the interviews. Pam. Can you restate your number of applicants for the number of slots that got kind of lost in the rest of the detail? We currently have five applicants for three slots. I thought there were only two people that were that were uh, is this planning board. This is planning board. There are three terms that are ending. Um, it, it's it's frankly probably no. Oh, given right. the the note from the planning board chair um, on on selection guidance, um, two of the individuals whose terms are ending do not intend to reapply. One has. Do you have more, Pam? Um, it, it sounds like uh, if we if we keep the if we keep the plate open um, as, until we get right up to the deadline, um, that seems like a decent number of people who are interested for um, for three for three positions, and I'd forgotten that there were three people. That was quite a large number at one time. So we're kind of having to do that each every couple of years to give it that same yeah. cluster. Yeah, every three years it's three. The other two it's two. So, any other thoughts on sufficiency or? ability to or willingness or thoughts on declaring the pool sufficient if such a motion were to be on the table. Can you say again, th five applicants for three spots. I wrote down the, the ZBA, but not the planning board. So the ZBA is where we had three Identifying as female to but, identify. As no, female. these were I, I I these were all planning board. I have all a, planning board. We're I'm all sorry. everything okay. I said was all planning board. Planning we're board. we'll move to ZBA once we do okay. the planning board sufficiency. I, I, I wrote down that wrong. Pam. So, so Mandy, um, just to just to make sure we're all clear, these are folks who have responded that yes, they're interested. Um, they have not yet sent in a statement of 
interest. And the statement of interest is really what, what locks us into the, the total number of people that are really and truly to be considered for the position. And I think last time we, um, we had some folks that said, yes, they were interested, but then never did send in a statement of interest. So we ended up with a much smaller pool than we thought we had. Yeah. So at this point, we would be declaring a pool sufficient based on the number of people who have submitted community activity forms since the bulletin board posting was put up almost six weeks ago now, I think. Um, to continue to remain applicants and in the pool, they would then have to submit a statement of interest and attend the interview. And it is sometimes at that stage where we end up with a pool we thought was highly sufficient you know, in past, it's given past examples, we've had one or two openings and we've had eight or nine people. And then when statements of interest deadlines roll around, we have two submitted. Um, so, you know, but we can't move on to statements of interest under the town council policy until we've declared the pool sufficient. Pam. I move that the that the pool of applicants be considered sufficient uh, to enable us to move to the next step. And this is for the planning board. Planning board. I would second. Thank you for the second, Jennifer. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll take a vote, Shalini. Yes. Uh, Pat. Aye. Uh, Mandy is an aye. Jennifer. Yes. Sorry, I skipped you, Pam. Pam. <laughs> Pam, yes. That passes unanimously. Um, we are, we're going to deal with the other sufficient pool so that we know what we're talking about in the next step. Um, so now we're going to talk about the ZBA pool. Um, right. Pam, would you like to do that? summary or would you like me to? Um, I would be happy to give a summary. Um, we have three brand new casts that were submitted with uh, since the posting of the openings and we have um, 11 people that have that um, had previously submitted casts or are incumbents and so there were 11 people that were contacted uh, to determine their continued interest. I have heard back from three of them. So at this point, we I would consider that roughly, um, I'm sure there are more, uh, given the number of incumbents or the number of people whose terms only started months ago. Um, so I would say at this point, we have at a minimum uh, six people who have have basically stated that they are and continue to be in, interested. We have two full member openings and four associate member openings to be filled. I have a question, Pam. So I'm looking at this the chart, and um, there are four applicants who have submitted CAF since the CBA appointment went up. But you talked about one of whom is is a reapplication. Um, but that's all that I can see. And our policy requires anyone who's interested to submit a new CAF after the bulletin board notice goes up. So I'm confused as to you indicated there might be two other people who might be reapplying that have indicated their interest, but they have not they, submitted CAFs. Right. So I they have, uh, um, let's see, so three brand new people and a CAF from a current member who is interested in being considered for renewal. And those are the only casts, so there are four casts. So that that means I, I just want to make sure I'm 
clear for two full members and four associate members, we basically have four applications. Is that correct? It certainly doesn't seem as if the pool is sufficient. It is hard getting people to apply. <laughs> Some people have, have said um, uh, yes, but I haven't decided if I want to be um, a full member or associate member, depending on the amount of time it takes. And I think I think in the case of being an associate member, it may be a little hard to predict because you're not exactly sure which project you're assigned to. Um, yeah, and so... Pam, I would encourage you for whoever has, has done that, encourage, encourage them to submit a CAF. When they submit a statement of interest, they can always indicate. And I think it's actually one of the questions we sometimes ask the CBA because there are these differences. Um, they can always indicate what they want to be considered for one or the other or both. Mm -hmm. um, um, Pam and I met with Rob Wachilla and... Chris Brestrup about the ZBA last last week, I think, um, to get an idea as to what hearings might continue over the line, as it were, and what to do about that. Um, they are the planning staff is working really hard to try and not open any other hearings until after July one, so that there is not sort of that over the line hearing issue, um, but there are a lot of hearings coming up. And so um, it is a body that needs five people to sit on a hearing basically. Um, and so we we need to find a way to find, to, to keep those appointments um, in the past, at least for those hearings that have continued over that line we have extended the term for those who are sitting on those hearings. Um, we always talk to them first. We have also in the past sometimes said when we're faced with a situation like this that um, we'll declare the pool sufficient to at least interview for full members. Um, and after the interviews, make a determination as to whether, you know, continue to accept applicants and all, and then decide whether to go back out for associate member and, and do it there, but but at least be able to start the process knowing we're looking at a minimum for full members at that time, whether or not we decide to do associate members at the same time, it can get dicey um, when you interview people and you know you have associate openings. Um, but that has been something I think CRHC has done in the past. So I wanted to bring that up too. Shalini. I was wondering if it would make sense for us as a committee to identify which schools in UMass and Amherst College might have relevant expertise, and then we can write to people, we, like we can actually write, send a write-up about the time expectations and what's needed to, you know, we, like we know Steve is an architect and, you know, and so we can send it, target it to these departments. Pam. Great idea. Um, I was going to refresh my memory. At one point, we talked about not having to resubmit a CAF if it had been done within two years. And I'm, um, and I'm thinking specifically about the folks that we finally, you know, got on board very late in the process last year. And do they, I mean, if they express uh, interest and they send in a statement of interest, do we need to go through that um, requirement of submitting a new CAF? Oh, I, thought we, I thought we had gone back and forth on that last year. So we did. But that was after we sought, it was a, a different circumstance and it was in response to the fact that we still had openings after our July 1 appointments and were immediately reopening 
the search. And so the people who had submitted CAFs a week prior, um, the council voted that we could go back two months and not require those individuals to resubmit a, a CAF. Um, this is the policy on um, making recommendations. And as you see, only those individuals who submit a CAF after the notice is published shall be considered part of the applicant pool going forward. Um, and we look back two years to re-ask. Mm -hmm. um, okay. That's the, within two years, will be contacted to re-ask and to indicate that they must resubmit. Um, and one of the reasons we do that for a little history um, is because since our terms are only two years, um, not every counselor will have seen every CAF for every applicant um, because we tend to do the appointments. The first set of appointments the council does is less than six months into their term and you're looking back two years. And so if you haven't been on the council, you will not have received in your email all of the applicant CAFs. So it's one way to sort of reset and assure that every counselor has knowledge of the pool as it stands. Um, so that's the policy. We must follow the policy. We cannot waive the policy. We have to ask if we want it waived, we have to go to the council for a waiver. Okay, thank you. That's what I needed. It, it sounds like, I'm just going to try and summarize, it sounds like people are on, uh, not unwilling, but um, hesitant to declare this pool sufficient at, at this time, um, given, given where it stands. And so if that is the case, Pam and I will continue to do reach out. Um, uh, I think Shalini's suggestion was fantastic. Um, you know, I when when I'm, I tend to send the about the ZBA or about the planning board when I'm doing my own recruiting and saying, hey, are you interested? That's the document I send them. Um, so that could be something along with the link to the CAF form. Um, that could be something, Pam, that we could send out to the departments, relevant departments potentially. Jennifer. Yeah, no, I just thought of that because with the local historic district, we used to do that to get an architect, and they actually just got one from emailing Steve Schreiber. <laughs> so that's a great suggestion, yeah. <laughs> okay, so with that, we won't take a motion because it sounds like we're kind of in agreement at this point and no one's quite ready to make a motion on that. Um, I will put that back on the to-do. Um, Andy? Yep, Pam. I will, I will reach out to the folks that I sent notices or, you know, letters to um, two weeks ago. And so again, I've only heard back from three of those folks that I sent messages to. I will follow up and say, please, please, you know, give us a calf. The link is there. It's very straightforward. I would, I would love to be able in that same transmittal, however, to send the information about the zoning board. So I'm hoping that we discuss that today. So we have sort of um, our our description, our handout at least of the ZBA so they understand what, what it's all about. So the about the ZBA handout is on the website and it was updated. You you in fact updated it and we accepted those updates. That was um, last year and I think the date needs to change each year. No, that was to remove um, I mean, we could update it again. Right now it says Chris Brestrup is the contact and we now know Rob Wachilla is the contact. <laughs> so, but we we did update it about two months ago. Um, so that one is up to date because um, Chris even, I believe, reviewed it. Uh, so, so that's ready to go. The selection guidance we can look at, um, but that's what we're gonna move on to for planning board right now. And then we'll see what we can do with CBA on that. Um, we. We have to hear from chairs before we can formally adopt selection guidance. But um, the selection guidance from the, the suggestions from the chair of the planning board are in your packet, um, as well as the 
the last, um, I'm trying to find my document of it, the, the last time we adopted selection guidance, there it is, um, is, is also in the packet. Um, so what the last year's selection guidance adopted shows is last year's chairs um, guidance. Um, I think we copied it directly. Um, and the section A is directly out of the policy. So that's where section A comes from. It's within the council policy. Um, and section B from the Word document you're looking at from last year was last year's input from the chair. Um, we have new input. Um, and so we just have to decide um, what we're doing. And I believe we can also adopt, we can provide selection guidance that does not just state restate A and add the input. I think we could add our own if we wanted. Um, but but that A should not change because that's out of the policy. But I think we can add our own and, and choose to do what we want with the chair's selection guidance. So thoughts, um, and it, I don't know which document people want me to put up, which is why I haven't shared either of them yet. So um, start with the planning board. So this is what came from Doug. Um, I'm looking at the last line that talks about, in particular, Jack Dempsey's departure will leave the board without expertise in civil engineering. And I think that was a good year ago. That That's last year's. If you look at the screen share, it's the PDF this year is this year's guidance from, I, I think it's nearly identical to last year's other than the last paragraph where he okay. talks about the three members whose terms are expiring. Yeah. Um, and the only thing I would have us do is potentially reword we don't have to adopt his guidance word for word we the policy just requires us to solicit it and then we can do what we want with it um i've always thought the chairs have provided good guidance um but the last paragraph um talks about the two members who um depart are departing but then it says a continuing board member and our policy does not automatically reappoint continuing members. And this seems to imply that they would automatically be reappointed. So so I, I would change continuing board member to something like the reapplying board member or something, <laughs> some some wording like that. Yeah, um, that was confusing. So I thought would yeah. be that that was the only thing I would personally think about changing from the chairs. <laughs> guidance. Other thoughts? Go ahead, Pat. Go ahead, Pat. I was probably going to say the same thing. You're muted, Pat. Sorry. Uh, I was looking at this. Uh, let me see. As expertise in civil engineering, including so, uh, traffic and stormwater engineering, just as we were talking about reaching out to uh, architects that we know at the universities or at the colleges to get interested people, students, faculty, shouldn't we be reaching out to the civil engineering department, particularly at UMass then? I think that's a good point. And maybe some of the other ones, but 
you know, civil, I, I don't know whether they're all considered civil engineers, but the engineering departments in general, Pam. They're not, they're not all civil. <laughs> I was going to I um so I was going to make a motion that we that we adopt these with the with the um, modification that was noted by Mandy to not assume that the that the the third candidate uh, or one of the candidates who is currently on the board isn't necessarily a re reapplication or reworded it before. Okay, so so this is. Um, a motion to adopt the selection guidance. I, we can't really say as presented. It would be like sort of as compiled. As discussed or compiled. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As, as compiled um, with um, the change in reference to the, regarding the re re reappointment applicant. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Jennifer. Any further discussion? Can you Seeing none. Oh. Can you enlarge? Can you enlarge it a little bit? Because it... this one. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. So I would work on those three words. Um. Well, I would add continuing board members and reapplying board members or something mm -hmm. because it actually lists all of them, right? <laughs> yeah. So it would be adding the words something like and reapplying board members. Yes. And has that has that third person said they are interested in, in reapplying? They they have submitted a CAF. Okay, good. So yeah. Okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll start with Pat. Aye. Um, Mandy is an aye. Uh, Pam. Aye. Jennifer. Aye. Yes. And Shalini. Yes. That is an unanimous vote. Um, we will move on to um, ZBA. Let me get that one up. As you're bringing that up, Mandy Jo, can I just make a point? Sure. Uh, it was kind of what Pat said, but they've listed, you know, urban planning, zoning, landscape, architecture, this, this, this. So maybe, uh, and we could, if we have personal contacts, sure. But I think maybe the the community outreach, like Tony Marulas and Nancy Buffon, like sending them. I think once when I had spoken to Tony, it said they would be happy to share our emails with the department heads. So if you have personal contact, sure, but I think sending these names of departments and then that whole packet and link just to Tony and Nancy and ask them if they they would be willing to do it, that would make it easier for whoever is doing this. <laughs> Sounds like a plan, Pam. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. That's one email for you with a list of departments. <laughs> um, so. This is the selection guidance that was adopted last year. As you'll see, it takes the same format as the planning board selection guidance um, with A being a copy from the um, policy and B basically being the insertion of um, responses from the chair. Um, I forgot to ask Pam to send an email to the chair till about Monday. I was shocked I was able to get Doug's um, response in time for this meeting. Um, I, I don't know, Pam, have we heard from Steve yeah. Judge? Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is what he wrote, well, a couple two years, times. two times. Two yeah. <laughs> two, two years worth of Steve Judge's um, things. So he may end up writing very similar um, stuff. Who knows? Um, so I don't know if we can adopt it until we receive his updated guidance. Um, we'll do that as quick as we can, but um, I think uh, 
what I would suggest, Pam, you were looking to have something so you could send it out to um, current applicants or those that are thinking of applying? Um, well, there are only four current applicants if you want to count the CAS as the current applicant. Uh, so I, I don't think we can send the old selection guidance as what this year's is. If people are asking, well, what are you looking for? I think what would be fine is you could say, well, this is last year's guidance. We have not adopted this year's, as long as you make it clear that it could change. I, if, if, if people ask and you're comfortable with that, um, but, you know, we'll, we'll do our best and I'll put it on for when we get Steve Judge's response. Well, we'll put it I'll, on that I'll one. I'll ask again to see if he can, <clears throat> I mean, I'd love, to, I'd love to just have him say what we said last year. <laughs> well, it, but he might have to update the where the ZBA stands currently from two years ago. <laughs> things have changed right so um you know as, as, as you see so so the first set is 2022 but this set he referenced in his 2022 email oh, and so it's from 2021 so we just put it back in so okay. it's it's quite almost two years old now so Okay, any other thoughts on the ZBA selection guidance at this time? Which brings us to, does this committee want to attempt to adopt um, interview questions for the planning board today? Or do we wanna hold off on that? Pam. I thought they're still pretty valid and um... I don't think conditions have changed too much in town that we could re readopt. So these are what we used last year. Did anyone feel last year's questions? I mean, what did people feel about it? Did they work? Did they not work? Were there some that didn't work as well as others? I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Pam indicated she thought they were sufficient. Yeah, they look really good. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. So is there a motion to adopt? Um, um, last year's question this year. I, I don't a, even know how to word, word it. Yeah, Pat. Question. Carol's banging around in the kitchen, so if that's irritating, but um, I'm wondering if the, is there going to be any possibility to do up any follow up questions or anything like that to anything that they reply? Mm. And that would be different for different people if it came. So, um, interviews. Um, I think I think what we had to do last year was ask the council to allow us to ask follow-up questions for the ZBA interviews because it's not part of the policy anymore. Um, so if that's something the committee would like us to do, we can send that motion back to the council like we did last year. Um, I think that's a good idea. Um, are we soliciting questions from them in advance? And including them, that's section eight. Oh, we have not yet. So thank you for that. So we probably should not adopt today. Did we do that last year? We did. I don't Fine. think we received any. Okay. 
Oh, that's right. You did it in an email, not in a meeting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, I tend to do it in an email um, and I don't think I received any. So that is, I completely forgot about that one. Um, wait, wait a minute. Remind me. So, so we sent out interview questions and said, if you have any questions, please get back to me. Is that how you phrased it? Um, I think what I typically do is I send out the questions we used the year before and say at the next meeting, the CRC will be discussing interview questions. Um, if you have any questions, um, if you have any questions you would like us to consider as we um, think, you know, consider adopting, you know, as we work towards adopting interview questions, please forward them to me by X date. Um, or if you have any comments on the questions we used last year. It, there's probably some standard language somewhere that I tend to use, but that's basically what I say. Do you have comments on what we used last year and are there anything else you would like us to ask? A lot of times what I get back are versions of the questions we're already asking. <laughs> so. So I don't, I don't think, I don't think my messages last year went out to people with that intent. I don't remember doing that for ZBA. I might have done it for both last year. I don't remember. So to but me, that, that seems well, okay. I mean, that's it's nice to solicit input. Um, it's so, like one more round of back and forth, which. So what we could do is adopt these questions pending, um, you know, additional discussion if counselors provide other questions, right? We could sort of preliminarily adopt and see if anything else comes through. Pam? Regarding regarding Pat's um, interest in perhaps having the ability to follow up, can we not um, set that in stone? Can't, can't we get permission? I thought, I actually thought that permission from town council last year enabled us to continue doing that. I didn't realize it was a year by year policy. Um, I would love to say in these interview processes, if there is an opportunity or clarification is needed, you know, we would, we would appreciate having the ability to ask follow-up questions. It worked really well last year. Um, and that we would set that as the standard practice in our interviews. That way we don't have to go back every single year and ask for that capability. So, so the way to do that is to add it to the policy. <laughs> so that can be part of our motion um, yeah. is to request the council um, allow CRC to ask follow-up questions during ZBA and planning board interviews and request that the council amend its policy, whatever section, to allow a committee to decide um, whether to ask follow-up questions or not and how that would structure. I'd come up with some language, but that's basically what it would be. How do you feel about that, Pat? Pat or Jennifer? No, I'll let Pat go first. Can Pat hear us? My hand's not up and I yeah. I didn't hear it. Did you ask? Pam asked you a question. I I just said this sounds like it would be something for Pat if that's GOL would need to craft um, a change in the policy. That's true. And I'm I'm thinking about having to do that because we're going to be doing interviews for non-voting resident members of finance. So yeah, I mean, we could just ask them that they amend it, and then the council can decide whether to do that or to send it to GOL for discussion, <laughs> right? We, we can do it either way. I, I would say we just ask the council to amend it yeah. and see what the Why council decides do to do. Directly? I think that's a good idea. Then, especially since you have a chair of GOL who's a procrastinator. 
it seems like a step we don't have to <laughs> take. And we had really good wording last year. Yeah. So are we asking in the next, you know, in the next council meeting uh, for CRC, Mandy or Pam doing? I'm working on a motion here, so I might have it in a second. Um, that one was not a full motion. Um, Just bear with me here. I don't know which committee. what um, meeting we did it at the council. Um, I thought it was ZBA. Oh, you mean which date meeting? Yeah, which, which meeting we voted that at the council. Oh, wait, here we go. Um, so the wording, okay. Okay, so. sections eight and nine. Okay, so here is the motion. So the motion is to request the council allow the CRC to ask follow up questions oh, wait, to waive So it's I apologize, Kelly, for how long this is going to be. Um, to waive motion to request the council waive sections eight and nine of the town council policy on making recommendations for town council appointments to multiple member bodies. To allow. Um, to be able to ask individual follow-up questions of applicants during the interviews and to request the council amend section eight of the town council policy on making recommendations, yeah, making recommendations for town council appointments to multiple member bodies um, in order to be able to ask follow individual follow up questions of applicants during interviews. So that's the motion. Is there a second? Second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, um, I guess I start. I'm an I. Uh, Pam. I. Jennifer. Yes. Uh, Shalini. Yes. And Pat. Aye. That is a unanimous vote again. So there we go. Um, we will deal with interview questions next meeting. Um, I will solicit the questions, anything from the, the council. I think that takes us through our action items, or well, that action item. Um, Next up is permitting fee structure. Um, residential rental bylaw permitting fee structure. We will not be getting to nuisance house bylaw today. Um, 
the last time we mentioned this, we were thinking about the possibility of referring or rec requesting that the council refer this to the the fees themselves um, and potentially even the structure, but at least the fee, um, the setting of the fees to finance to make a recommendation. Um, but there was a request to have us discuss the structure itself so that we could give some guidance to potentially the finance committee on what we were thinking structure wise um, in terms of things. <laughs> There's so many different structures we've put out there. So it's back on. Um, I can pull up a document. Um, it'll take me a little bit. There you go. The, let's see, which one is this one? So this one's not very helpful, um, but this is sort of the document that, that we've been doing stuff, but um, this is the document in a sense we would send over. I know this one's not helpful, um, but it shows all of the fees we've talked about in the current draft of the bylaw. And I think what we need to be discussing is probably sections A and B. What do we want those structures to look like um, in terms of what does the residential rental permit fee include um, and what does it not include in terms of initial or renewal inspections? Um, so I think that's basically been our discussion with that one. Um, we can look at the sample fees that I've had looking at what they might look like based, you know, we've talked about also owner occupancy and not and things like that. We've got some samples in an Excel spreadsheet that have some actual fees attached to them. But I think more than that is just a discussion as to number one, does the rental registration fee, should it include the required initial or renewal inspection or not? Um, and then number two, should there be differences in rental permitting fees and potentially even inspection fees based on how many units are on a parcel and potentially the home or owner occupancy. Those are sort of the three questions I see um, that we might wanna make a recommendation to um, fi the finance or the council on without actually setting, recommending actual fees. So let's start with including the inspection renewal or um, initial inspection in the rental registration permitting fee. Is that something we want to recommend be done or not? Right now our bylaw has the permitting fee needing to be paid yearly and an inspection occurring every five years, unless you're on a different schedule, but the standard would be five years. So thoughts on that question. And then you're charged if you're, if you have to have an inspection because there's a complaint or a violation. That would be a different inspection fee. That would, we'd call it like the complaint inspection fee. That, that's why that, that sheet will change based on what we decide on these two items on whether the inspection fee is all inspections or everything but initial and renewal and, or maybe a follow-up because that's another question. If you fail the inspection, do you have to pay for the follow-up inspection too? Um, so those are all questions that people had said we might want to um, send some guidance over to finance and the council for. But let's start with whether the permit fee should include the required inspection. Shalini. I was thinking like, what is the simplify, simplest thing like for, and getting feedback from, that's my favorite question. 
put it back at the staff. But seriously, oh yeah, thank you. You're right there, Rob. So yeah, what would be the easiest for landlords and in, in terms of simplifying, streamlining the process? What do you recommend? Rob? So it might be tricky to try to uh, come up with a fee that will be charged annually that includes a five-year inspection. Um, you know, it might be hard, even if we could figure that out, it might be hard for people to understand that. Um, so I just wanted to mention that it is fairly easy for us to uh, customize the fee per property year to year. So what we would do is establish which properties we would intend to inspect that year. And essentially they get an invoice upon renewal uh, sort of like if you get the notice that your car registration needs to be renewed, that's the way we're doing things now with these permits. So we can we can have a different fee for the, the properties that have inspections and the properties that don't. So that might be my suggestion right now, thinking about it uh, quickly. Uh, but I just wanted you to know that that is a possibility that we can handle it that way. and might make the clearest um, sense of the fee schedule to the applicants. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Rob. That's so just to make sure I understood what you said. Um, if, for instance, you had a, um, a a renewal notice went out and it was going to be that that property's uh, opportunity for an inspection that year, that would be that notice would be included in the in the renewal notice. Right, that 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 would indicate that they're scheduled for an inspection that year, and the fee would then be appropriate for that to occur. Yes. So I think if I'm understanding right, sorry, Pam, it would be there'd be a registration fee without inspection, and a permit fee with inspection is sort of what you're saying, is what it would look like on the fee schedule. Is that right, Rob? Well. I think it could just be an inspection fee and then, you know, we take care of it from there for whatever purpose the inspection is, it could be charged throughout the year, but in that renewal notice, one property might have just the permit fee and the other, another one might have a permit fee plus an inspection fee because they're scheduled to be inspected that year. Pam? Yeah, so that, that strengthens my thinking that uh, a permit a permit fee should be separate from an inspection fee and not try to lump them into one fee applicable across five years that somehow covers the inspection as well because it you get, you get lost yeah Jennifer no that was really um, answered my question it, it does seem to make it would be clearer to the uh, lamp to the property owner. And I would add, I, I think I'm in agreement with Pam, I would add that it actually satisfies one of our original goals of redoing this was to um, somehow provide a benefit to those properties who are well kept um, in terms of comply with all of the laws because they would be facing that inspection fee only every five years versus one that needs an inspection every year because they are not complying with the laws. They, they, the people that need the inspection every year, the properties that need that would have a higher yearly cost in a sense than those that are on that five-year schedule because they'd only be paying that inspection fee once every five years instead of ever building it into everyone's every year. So I think it fits that goal too. Do people generally agree with that one? Okay. So to sum that up, the inspection the inspection fee would be would be added to the invoice, if you will, on the year that inspection was going to occur for that property. And that would it could show a breakdown of permit inspection for this year, something like that, just so there's really clear that it's two items. Yeah, the, we can do that in the uh, the renewal notice in, in an invoice, listing it separately. Yes. 
So the next question is, we'll stick with the permit fee. Um, and this is, should there be different fees for different numbers of units on a parcel? This is the permit fee to register. Or should there be different permit fees if you are owner occupied? Those are sort of the two things we've talked about on permit fees are a, a different cost to obtain a permit for owner occupancy and a different cost to potentially obtain a permit based on how many units are being included in that permit. So thoughts on those two questions, Pam. Oh, sorry, I didn't, I haven't thought it, I haven't thought it out yet. Jennifer. Um, I would say yes to both. I feel more strongly about, and then I don't know how we should st structure it. I think that somebody that is getting a permit for one rental should not pay the same as someone that's getting it for 25 or 50. How we want to, you know, if we want to group it that every 10, there's a different, uh, yeah, that I don't, I haven't, I don't know. I'd be open to lots of suggestions. Um, I, I think I would like to see if we could a, a lower fee for owner occupant just to encourage that. But I feel, yeah, I feel more strongly about that. You know, right now it's this one permit, whether, and it's, it does, people feel that that's very unfair if they own one unit that they're paying, they have paying the same for a permit of someone that has a hundred units. Thank you. Shalini. Yeah, I would agree that if we can lower, give some incentive to owner occupied. And to the other, also, if it feels right what you're saying, Jennifer, that, I mean, that's kind of what we're hearing, that if someone has so many units and one unit, um, in terms of uh, staff time and effort, what my understanding was, it's similar, is it? Like how much, how different is it if you're, doing permitting for single unit versus 500 units. Rob? It's not much different at all. Uh, you know, I think at the initial review for a new permit, it could be a little bit more involved if there's a larger property, larger parking plan to review, uh, but not significant. And I think, you know, I've always, uh, I've been, pretty consistent about this over the years that that's why I never suggested anything other than just a flat fee. Um, unfortunately, with the, the breakdown, the way the units are mostly being one and two family units, it becomes really difficult to set a fee schedule, uh, you know, any differently and cover the costs we were trying to cover. So I, as you get into that, um, and I know now with the inspection fee element, it'll make it different. Uh, but it becomes really different, difficult to set a fee for the larger properties because there's so few of them that really makes an impact enough to lower that uh, permit for the single family house. Because we've got, I think, seven, over 700 single family properties out of the 1,200 total properties. So it's, it's a big number to, to make work on that type of breakdown. But the, the steps and the, the staff time on renewal uh, would be the same no matter the size of the property. So, Pam, and then I'm going to go. I'm, I'm just thinking about the tracking. So um, I, I'm also trying to relate it to what, what's happening in the nuisance property or, um, <clears throat> bylaw. If you're tracking a particular uh, unit in a complex, so building 2B, was a problem and you had to you had to assign you know complaint whatever there were complaints you had to um, issue fees in the in the general permit for the property are you going to have to create in your essentially in your database a um, a breakdown of each and every unit that's in that property so all 200 or 100 are accounted for separately, maybe rolled up into the complex and the permit, but in fact, not going to take some work to set up. 
we don't know. I don't know yet. You know, th that's going to be part of the build out phase. Um, I started asking those questions. Our, our IT staff will have a, um, a very important role in this. Um, if it's similar to the way our building permits work, it's fairly easy. You know, so we can have we can issue a building permit to a, a property and then indicate each unit separately for inspections and, uh, you know, if there are certificates or mix of uses. But I, you know, I what you're saying makes complete sense. It should take more time to build that out, uh, but I just don't know how involved it would be yet. We haven't we haven't begun those discussions and there likely will be a cost to our our provider to develop that part of the program that we're not using. So we don't we don't use our permit program for uh, complaint tracking and ticketing, but we really want to uh, and hope that the, the system was um, was shown to us with that capability and we saw parts of it being used in Brookline and Cambridge. So I, I expect that would get built out, but I don't have any more details about that at this time. Thank you. Um, so one of my questions is with what Rob said earlier about the initial review might be more involved depending just, just in general and then potentially for those with more units on an initial review versus a renewal permit. Should we really be discussing different fees for the first time you get a permit under the new system versus renewing your permit under the new system since a renewal presumably many of the things we're requiring about management plans and parking plans and all of that has already been reviewed and so does not need the eyes on it that the first time you're asking for the permit, you would such that the first permit you get might need to cost more to cover those extra eyes that the second, third, 10th year, you just don't have to spend as much time on that. And then I guess the other question I would have, Rob, is with that first one, are there differences in time if they've never had a permit before between someone with one unit and someone with 20 units? Or is it still basically the same amount of time? It's just they've never had the permit before. So that's what takes more time than the number of units. Uh, I can answer some of that. Um, the the never having a permit to having a permit really doesn't make too much of a difference. The applicant is doing all the work, uh, filling out the online registration. There's not a whole lot that we're doing uh, after the fact that's different. So I would say that's not really a significant um, concern for staff time. Um, I'd like to probably ask some questions of IT to better understand what they know about how it would you know, what it would look like to build out for additional units. Um, I, it, I'm certain that it would only be in that first round, that first time of setting that up for the property and not year to year. Uh, but, I, but I think I probably should ask some questions from those who know a little bit more or, um, you know, if we have enough questions for IT, we certainly can invite them to a meeting and talk to them some more. Thank you. Um, Shalini. I'm thinking now from the tenant's point of view. So if we're charging 150 and there's a single unit, the tenant is absorbing $150, which can be a huge uh, amount for them. And if there were like 100 units, then it's 150 divided by 150 units and it gets distributed over 150 units. Do you see what I'm saying? So that's why it sort of makes sense to have a lower base. Um, let, let's and and then find how much do we need to recover to break even with our, because we can't make a profit on it. But how much do we need to break even, and then have like a lower, basic, let's say fifty dollars per whatever, and then the rest has to be incremental so that it gets distributed over more tenants. Does that make sense? Thoughts? I think that was one of the concerns we were hearing from people earlier that y'all increased it. And then if they have one tenant, it's going to be absorbed. The whole 150 is going to be absorbed by a single tenant. 
Yeah, it, it's certainly a concern we've heard. Pam. Yeah, I was I was going to say that. Um, I think it does, it does sound inequitable, and I think that was definitely one of the the concerns that was raised. Um, it feels like it feels like a. Um, trying to figure out how to say this. Um, I think I think Mandy Joe has taken some time to sort of look create a table with some of these some of these elements in it. And it feels like a, a little bit of a table would be very helpful in which we would have, you know, owner occupied as as a category, um, number of units as as an element, um, base fee, inspection fee, and be able to really understand the impact of having multiple units. Um, it, it's really tough uh, just thinking out loud. If, if someone has two or three apart or buildings that they manage, uh, homes that they manage, um, yeah, right, right. Um, that, that the fee that they pay, in fact, as Shalini said, does does impact them, you know, it, it hits them right in the stomach because it is the same fee that that um, a large complex potentially could could pay. And the only difference then is that a complex will have an, an ongoing inspection cycle because we divide the total number of units up by you know how many get inspected each year they're going to have a significantly different inspection fee than the <clears throat> than the smaller manager. And that's really the only difference. So um, yeah, it comes back to the question of does the does the, the basic permit fee vary depending on the size of the property? Yeah. So so what Pam was referring to was this chart, this is just the PDF of it. There's an Excel spreadsheet where you can play with numbers, but this one, this this top section here um, is sort of the op one of the options we've been talking about, right? If we separate the permit fee from the inspection fee. Um, and and the the thing, you know, don't don't necessarily take the numbers as as anything yeah. given, right? <laughs> and you just pick something and see what happens, right? So in something like this, it doesn't matter how many units you have, this is the owner occupancy. And so there are 169 uh, parcels of owner occupancy that have up to six units um, in town that are rented. And so an owner occupancy restriction or discount would affect 169 out of 5,000 rental units, rental, um, um, well, it's 169 units, 127 permits um, out of about 1,200 permits. Um, there are 1,000 permits in the 1 to 30, 18 in the 30 to 99 rental units, and 12 that have more than 100, 100 or more dwelling units on the parcel. Um, and so, you know, this is a flat fee for everyone else except the owner occupied. I don't think I had an owner occupied and a different fee for other things, but um, I'm going to go up to a structure we didn't, we're not necessarily requiring because it shows something like this. This one is an owner occupied, um, essentially with a discount, even though it doesn't look like a discount, um, because the owner occupied does not get an additional fee per rental unit. Um, and so, it basically is a discount, um, no matter how many, whether you're renting, whether you have two units and occupy one, and so you're renting one, or whether you're renting five, because there's a total of six units, you pay $175. If you um, are renting one to 29 units within a parcel and no owner occupancy, the person who's renting only one would pay 175, but once you get up to two, you would pay an additional 50 for every unit you rent. Um, that still applies to a thousand. So you collect obviously a lot more fees. The maximum someone, a, a owner would be paying per year 
on a basis like this is $1,625 to get their permit. When you go up, even if you decrease the additional fee per rental unit, you start seeing those 12 prop parcels that have 100 plus units, it gets expensive quickly um, to get your rental permit. Um, we can show it with inspections too, but but that just gives you an idea of what a per, playing with a per unit cost does. And this is obviously a discounted per unit cost. Um, so Pam wanted some potential numbers to look at so we know what, <laughs> what this means when we're talking about it. This is one thing to show what it might mean. Yeah, thank you. That's that's very helpful. And, I, and again, the numbers are you picked a number, so yeah, you, have, yeah. you can play with them. But that's what those numbers are with those things in there, Jennifer. Yeah, so I, I'm just gonna throw this out. I mean, so like the number seemed high if you have more than a hundred units, but and I know you're just a number. So a num it's gonna seem there's a little bit of sticker shock when you just look at that. But when you think of how much income is being generated from 100 units as a percentage, it's not, it, it, I mean, it's probably not a lot of percentage of what's being generated monthly. And that's a, a yearly. Yeah, I mean, it takes the, to, to go to Shalini's point, um, it would mean that a, an owner occupied, you know, a, a one one rental unit would be paying that that one set of tenants for one dwelling unit would be absorbing $175. But when you get to the very larger ones with a, a structure like that one, each unit is absorbing approximately $40 to $45 instead of $175. Um, if you do it per unit, those numbers are even more shocking, right? Like imagine 175 times 100 is 17 thousand you know um so i guess my concern and i'll take my my opportunity is it always sounds great except we hear from rob you know especially from the tenant point of view right i totally get with shalini from the tenant point of view it just seems totally unfair that if you're living in a large apartment complex your per share per unit cost of that 175 is just pennies um you know dollars right a dollar a year or something, but a one unit person, it's $175 a year, right? But when I hear from Rob that the, um, the processing costs are nearly identical and we have to, under state law, I believe, associate the fees to what it costs, I have a hard time justifying for the permit fee that structured difference. That's a, for the inspection fee, I think it's a lot easier to justify that structured difference. But for the permit fee, I struggle with that justification, even though it sense, even from the tenant's point of view, I will say it it's just not fair, right? <laughs> um, but I, I don't know from the town's point of view and the legal point of view, whether we can justify $6,000 for a puffed in or whatever. I don't know which one of the 12 units has the most that I had the max on um, and 175 when the processing experience on the back end is exactly the same and takes exactly the same amount of time. Pam. So I, I, I think I still am comfortable with a base fee and then a, uh, and we haven't talked about numbers actually, but a base fee and then, and then some additional fee per unit. Um, I think we can set those numbers to the point where they make sense. Um, but to me that probably I, it still is. It still is a chunk. But if we make the numbers reasonable, um, I think I think people understand that there's a system. It has to be administered. 
and what does it take to administer permits and keep track of everything. Um, but I do, but I do appreciate the idea of having an additional fee for the additional unit. Shalini. And then we have to move to public comment and the rest. Yeah, I think that's what the finance committee can do is work out the exact numbers. But I think um, we know that um, property owners are going to transfer it. It's a cost. And so they are going to be able to transfer it. And it's going to be absorbed by tenants at a much lower rate um, when there's so many units. So even though it's a sticker shock, but it's it, they know that this can be divided over so many people. It's the smaller property owners that are trying to rent to families. And it, I think that's where the biggest, at least when I'm talking to the, a lot of uh, my friends are trying to rent to families, even though they're not earning as much, but they want to do that. And they're complaining about these high, you know, like charging 150, 175 from them, it's it just keeps adding up. Like the utilities and this, everything is going up, and then it becomes really challenging for the tenants' point of view. And that is one of our goals, also, is to make equitable, affordable. You know, so yeah. is that that much a problem, Rob? To justify per even though like you're saying it's not that much different especially after the second year is that going to be a legal problem to you like how is it that our town is structured different than boston and other places that do have a base fee and pre-unit rob i think the the legal problem for us is if we're challenged on it and we can't justify the the cost and the expenses. And I, you know, I speaking about what we did previously when we started the program at a hundred dollar fee. At that time, I couldn't justify it. I wasn't able to, um, you know, drop, bring down that price for the smaller properties and carry enough to cover the total amount that the town manager wanted to collect at the time, and then be able to justify it. So we have to we have to watch out for that and just, you know, my my department as a whole um, pretty much takes in the revenue plus 10 percent, which is the recommended, you know, maximum above uh, already, you know, with permit fees. So we just want to be careful that this isn't, you know, an, a way of creating a lot, lot of revenue that isn't justified by expensive expenses through our department. Um, but. You know, that's again, that's something for the finance committee to kind of weigh out too. Thank you, Jennifer. And then we're moving on. Yes, yeah, so I was just thinking if you could make it very low per, you know, so like it's very low for the, but if you have under a certain number of units, so, you know, maybe it's $30, $50, and then you would have to, to support the program, be charging more, you know, in, sort of um, graduated on a sliding scale for larger units. So let's say it was, you know, $30 a year if you have two or under or three or under, and then you're maybe doing it, a, you know, a certain like every 10, I don't know how you would do it. So that the, and then, so the cost would mostly be covered by the larger units. Is it, uh, I'm not a mathematician, so I don't know if that's making sense. I'm just trying to think if it's, if you have a it, really low number yeah. per unit, you could make your money and you're, you know, just charging. So if the fee gets passed on to one tenant, it's 30 or $50, but you're, you know, keeping, you're getting the revenue that you need to support the program through the other larger units. Um, and then if we, but if, if, that four hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars—that's what you want to raise. Was that I, Mandy Joe? You had that number down. So if so, we're going to add another inspector or two, wouldn't you need to raise more money? No, that was a based on that. That number was based on an assumption Rob thought we would need to raise under the current draft of the bylaw. So right now, the permit fees only raise about a hundred and sixty thousand. I believe we might be about two hundred now. I'm not sure. Um, so. 
so the four seventy five five hundred thousand was an estimate of what the program will cost under the new revisions. Right. So is there a way to keep the permit fees low and spread them out over a number of units? Well, I think that's the that's the finance committee, what we're going to recommend finance do. The question is, we want to get to a structure we want to offer them. But we do need to move on. I had my own comments I want to say, but we need to move on. We're at the time. Yeah. Right now, we're, we're going, we'll come back to it. So we're not done. <laughs> um, and, and we'll start with this question. Um, we're going to move on to general public comment, public comments on matters within the jurisdiction of CRC. Um, residents can express their opinion for up to three minutes. Um, and CRC does not engage in discussion or uh, dialogue or comment on matters raised within public comment. Um, okay. At this time, Renata Shepard, please unmute yourself and state your name where you live and make your comment. Hi, Renata Shepard Amherst. Um, my comment is basically, I feel like I'm just beating a dead horse, but small landlords should not be the ones to subsidize the rental bylaws versus multi-property landlords who charge the same or even higher rent. Permits by parcel make sense in order to, you know, to make it easier, but fees should be per rental unit. I still believe the fee should be based on rent charged. Maybe there is some kind of appeal to, um, if you charge a low rent um, and maybe have some kind of you know, reduction or discount or something. But as I said before, anything above $100 would hurt me personally. Um, if your permit fee has to cover personnel, that is a reason for having a fee, right? Uh, then every unit would have to contribute. Um, if you set a base of uh, $50, $50, $75, I don't know, plus additional fee per unit, then even if it's a lower fee per unit, hopefully the finance committee can come up with a number that would satisfy whatever you need to satisfy. But it should be fair because even, you know, the bigger properties, if they have, um, more cost, you know, they have on-site management. I understand that there is more, more cost involved, but they are incurring more rent also. So, you know, it, sh it should be at least somewhat fair, please. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Renata. Um, seeing no other hands. Um, we are closing the public comment period. The next thing is um, uh, the adoption of the April 27th, 2023 meeting minutes. Um, I will make the motion to adopt those minutes as presented. Is there a second? Second. Doing Pat se seconds that. Thank you, Pat. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, we're going to vote. Uh, we start with Pam. Aye. Jennifer. Aye. Uh, Shalini. Yes. Pat. Aye. Mandy is an aye. That is a unanimous adoption. Um, I don't have any announcements. Uh, next agenda is, oh, Pat, do you have an announcement? I, I just have a quick question for Rob. Sure. So I, it's not, I'm trying to figure out because there, there was a talk about the six units where there, it's owner occupied. How do you assure that a property that has six units ha uh, that's owner occupied is actually owner occupied? Well, she lives there. During the application process, it's it, it's not it's not confirmed. So uh, you know that that would come up through a complaint or um, you know the only other time we're really looking at that on our own is watching the transfers that occur month to month. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I have no announcements. The next agenda is going to be zoning, um, and we will put a few um, recommendation issues, the ZBA and planning board appointment issues on onto the agenda, but the I'm not going to put rental permitting on um, and all of that. We're, we're just going to push that off to June, um, but we will um, put what we need to for recommendations on that agenda, along with the de zoning discussion for the continued hearing that we continue today. Um, that is actually the next regular meeting. Next week, we have a meeting at 7 p.m. Uh, joint with the Housing Trust. It is a special meeting. 
Um, it starts at 7 p.m. We're aiming for two hours. It will be on Zoom. Um, look tomorrow for the agenda and the packet. Um, the packet is basically going to be a list of links to all sorts of housing policies. We're not putting all the documents into the packet. It would be hundreds of pages. It, so the, the request is that people sort of refresh their memories on housing um, and the housing studies that we've done, the comprehensive housing plan. So there's gonna be a whole bunch in there. Um, that's why we're getting it out tomorrow. So there's time. Um, I encourage anyone if they see the agenda and have questions about it, to contact myself or Jennifer. Jennifer was in the planning meeting, so can probably also explain the goals of the agenda and, and what's set forth in the agenda. We're trying to be somewhat specific so that people can get an idea of what we're doing. Um, but, but when I put that out tomorrow, feel free to ask me or Jennifer if you've got questions about the agenda. Um, and I wanna thank Jennifer for coming into that planning meeting um, for the meeting it next week. very interesting, yeah. And yeah. anyway, it'll be a... <laughs> And the housing trust is meeting right after this. If you want to. Yes. <laughs> and I have no items antici unanticipated. Does anyone else? Seeing none, thank you all. Uh, we are adjourned at 6 36 p.m. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.